Hello, folks, and welcome back to the Republic of Swordland. I am Mark, the man behind the curtain. Very excited to get back to Suzerain. But before we jump in, thanks so much to Boomstick uh, and Winter Twig for raiding us just before we got going there. That was super awesome. I was just scrambling to get everything ready. Otherwise, I would have started the stream early to thank you right away. But in any case, thank you kindly. So, if you are new here, uh, every Friday, the Temple Institute streams some, like, kind of story-based games. It's not really any theme to it anymore, but, uh, previously, we'd been streaming Suzerain, which is this amazing political simulator game kind of thing, but told in this really unique way that's... It, it was my favorite game of 2020, I'll just say that. Uh, and I tried to be a good president. I was leaning towards democratic social, uh, socialism, I improved healthcare, I tried to improve gender equality and race relations and education and all these things. And none of it mattered because my country was invaded and I was executed and my family was murdered, I assume. I, I don't know what happened to them. So this time, fuck it. No more half measures. I will be, uh, I'm, I'm a Stalin. Basically, is what I'm doing a Stalin playthrough, and I'm gonna fuck Rumberg, which is the country that uh, invaded me last time. I'm gonna kick the shit out of them, no matter what. So, uh, anything I'm forgetting? No, let's uh, let's jump in. Okay, I, I feel like now that I've played through this a few times, I have a better understanding of uh, of what's going on in the game. So hopefully that'll lead to better results. But let's. Uh, Let's do it to it. You are my enslavement and my freedom. You are my flesh burning like a raw summer night. You are my country. Nazim Hikmet Ran. Big time now, game. All right, here we go. 1908, Kingdom of Swordland. You opened your eyes to this world you came from. Okay, before we jump in, what is my, what is the goal? So the goal is we're gonna make Sorland a dictatorship with me as dictator. We're gonna lean towards uh, communism, AKA Malenshevism. Uh, and I'm gonna be a monster to everybody except my family and Sergei, my driver. That's kind of the, the tenets I'm working with this time around. I'm gonna pretend to love democracy I'm gonna pretend to work with the oligarchs, and then I'm gonna destroy them. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the plan. So, 1908, Kingdom of Swordland. You opened your eyes to this world. You came from a wealthy family in the city of Lackhaven. Never, I am not part of the bourgeoisie. A middle-income family, or an impoverished family. I'm impoverished. I'm like Stalin. I grew up in Georgia, had nothing. So impoverished it is. I should also say that this playthrough isn't necessarily gonna be the opposite of my first playthrough, rather just a heightened playthrough of some, I'm, I'm being stoned, I, I guess you get it by now. All right, your parents named you Anton. As the only child of a farmer, you spent your childhood among wheat fields. Life was not easy. You were too poor to afford a good education. The Rain family was caring regardless of the economically dire situation. Your parents always did their best to support you. The years passed. 1923, during a history class at school, the bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced the historic revolution. The kingdom was no more. The Republic of Swordland was born. Uh... How old am I? I was born in 1908. So I was 15, thereabouts? Uh... I was happy I had the day off. Let's say that. After graduating, you passed the university exam with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies. You chose... Uh, law, economics, or history. The first time I think I did law. This time I'm gonna do history. And that's in Dare as well, so I'm going to stick to my roots. Uh, 
During the first year, you attended a lecture with David Weesey. I like that guy. He was a well-known diplomat from the foreign ministry and the son of the president. After observing the hall in silence, he explained why real politic is important for a successful foreign policy. He argued that a strategy based on practical and material factors would be much more successful in reaching Swordland's ambitions. Yeah, I'm all about real politic. I agreed in principle. 1927, soldiers entered the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. Many were in shock as the uniformed men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students gathered in protest. Along with your best friend, Pete Vectern, you decided to... What would Stalin do? Protest! <laughs> I need better role models. Okay. One of the officers made a loud announcement that echoed throughout the campus. General Luteran declared martial law in order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You joined the students that slowly marched towards the large group of soldiers. Suddenly, the soldiers charged. A student fell and was trampled as everybody started running away. Uh, I held my ground. The soldiers beat you relentlessly. It was a gloomy year. Oh, God. <sighs> October 10th, 1927. The coup split the students into two groups and caused frequent fights. Torture and imprisonment of any opposing voice became a daily routine and dare. You didn't want to stay idle and decided to join... It's a shame a banditry group isn't an option here. Uh... Political debate. That's the way for Mr. Anton Rain. The dozens of debates helped you hone your oratory skills while also helping you grow your network. Even though the debates are pretty heated between different groups, you all grew from sharing ideas. In one of the meetings, Pete introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer for the Swordish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to her intelligence, beauty, or diligence. Uh... Diligence is a weird thing to be attracted to, so I think I'm going to pick that. Uh, the politically charged environment led you to join the re oh, thanks for Fishy the Man. Thanks for following. Alright, but the environment led me to join the Red Youth. I am a communist. Yes. 1928. The radio relayed that the communist general Ricard surrounded Lutheran and his troops demanding a surrender. They refused, and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You just couldn't believe it. The army was fighting amongst themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. Ricard's sudden attack caused more instability in the country, but compared to fascist Lutheran, he was a real socialist. This convinced you to partake in a support march. You were chanting... Bring down the fascists. No. Workers of the world unite. That's what's up. Stick with the classics. You were marching under the protection of Ricard's soldiers. The students opposing the coup gathered a few hundred meters in front of you. Many nationalists were among them. You knew something was going to happen. So I stayed. There was a massive clash between the two sides. Soldiers began to beat the students. Tanks started rolling forward. In this chaotic moment, you saw a young girl about to get run over by a tank. Uh, I guess I ran to save her. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go for it. But I couldn't reach her in time. Never did. Never forgot her face. Okay. The clashes escalated into a full-blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope, and love grew between the two of you. However, it was a difficult time for love. The chaos must end! 1929. The charismatic colonel, Tarkin Sol, orchestrated a sudden coup and brought an end to the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. He formed the United Swordland Party and ran as a presidential candidate in the first ever elections. And, uh, Master Thief Esquire, thanks for subscribing. Asking, have we wiped out the bourgeoisie yet? No, we're just getting started. Uh, I'm gonna vote for Seoul. Uh, 
Uh, USP won the election by a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. However, a letter arrived from the military calling you to fulfill your compulsory service. It was time for me to serve my national duty. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country, Wellen. The distinguished Major, Yosef Lancia, I'm recognizing that name now, ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was a very cold winter night when you began marching out of Gumren Outpost. I could see my breath, and hey, Tundra Foxnet, thanks for subscribing with Prime, saying Stalin time, yeah baby. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source. The squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees had made it beyond the border fence. You... I escorted them back. Swordland for the swords, that's what I unfortunately say. <laughs> the refugees were in despair when they realized that you were taking them back to the border. Screams and protests ensued as they were restrained. You delivered them to the border guards. After several months of military service, your duties ended and you went back to civilian life. You and Monica decided to share your lives together. After receiving the blessing of her parents, a ceremony was held in Whole Sword. During the same year, you were offered a high-paying job at the governing United Swordland Party. It was important to start your career on a good foot, so you accepted it. Uh, because... Working for the ruling party was the easiest path to power. Uh, you became the foreign policy assistant to one of the more experienced members of the assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late at work, reviewing dozens of foreign policy plans. I was climbing the ladder. Seoul strengthened the Republic by removing the institutions and symbols of the former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued, and people were the happiest they had been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided. President Tarkin Seoul was elected once more. 1934. The preparation of the most comprehensive trade agreement with Agnolia was occupying most of your personal time. But your significant contribution to the trade talks triggered an invitation to meet President Tarkin Sol himself, who offered you a key position. You were to become the youngest member of Assembly. I accepted right away! As the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Pete along as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a brief moment of joy and relief. But I sacrificed family to improve my position in the party. Family's just a means to an end, baby. 1941. Along with Pete, you have done great things to cement your position in the party. Meanwhile at home, Monica and Frank felt your absence. At the same time, President Tarkin Sol, or Sol increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. President Sol barely secured a majority in the election against the opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for a United Swordland Party Congress became louder as a leadership struggle started to brew. I watched from the sidelines and decided to bide my time. I don't care about sides, I care about becoming president. I'm gonna wait until someone wins and then join them. The contender for party leadership was Edward Alfonso, a reformist and talented business magnate with a growing popularity within the party. Meanwhile, in a desperate attempt to secure votes before the Congress, President Sol was meeting party members one by one. He approached me too. The President offered you the position of Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the next government if you backed him in the upcoming vote. Uh. No, fuck you, Sol. Your time is over. Uh, the party congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of USP were decorating every possible spot. 
Thousands of influential political figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership began. Uh, I'm gonna vote for Tarkin's soul. Better the devil I know rather than this Edward Alfonso. Unfortunately, Saul lost the leadership vote to Edward Alfonso with a small margin. During the Congress, Saul announced his retirement from politics. The systems he had established were to stay much longer. His achievements wouldn't be forgotten. Um... I was happy... Uh, I was... I was troubled. His time was over, but, uh... That doesn't mean I have to like it. A month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Deanna. She motivated you during a tumultuous period in the party. The general elections were approaching. The United Swordland Party was under the new leadership of Edward Alf or Awald. Oh, am I calling him Edward? Edward? Awald Alfonso. I think I'm pronouncing his name wrong this entire time. Okay. Uh, I did my best not to help him. I think he's, uh, well, I mean, I know he's going to be a lame duck. During the general elections, the main opposition leader was embroiled in a sex scandal with a secretary, diminishing their chances. The extensive privatization program proposed by Ewald Alfonso secured an election victory for the USP. Over the next years, you tried all that was necessary to climb up the ladder. The presidency of Ewald Alfonso saw many bold reforms, but was followed by a serious economic recession. The other parties announced their bids for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition efforts to win. I worried that my reputation would be tarnished along with Alfonso. Together with Pete, your presence in the USP grew and you became the face of a new wing in the party. You effectively took, or took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. The moment to make a move had come. I bribed and extorted Alfonso's inner circle. 1953. Most of the inner circle abandoned him. President Alfonso started to reshuffle his cabinet, but it was too late. The party eventually voted you in as the leader after your efforts. Following this, you announced that you'd be running for president in the general election with Pete as my running mate. It was my turn. After visiting every city and town during the campaign, I made a speech on state television. I promised to preserve national values. What those are, we'll decide later. Great nation of Swordland, due to the incompetent leadership, enemies both internal and external are influencing our glorious nation. Today, more than ever, we need to unite under one flag and protect our values. Greki Swordland! The broadcast ended. On election day, millions went out to cast their votes. It was time to face the truth. I wonder if there's a way to lose the prologue. That would be funny. Chapter 1. President Rain. Man, I love this game. I'm glad to be back. Okay, as Anton Rain, you have made many promises to the people of Swordland in order to gain their votes. They must be considered very carefully. Economy. Um, Swordland's economy has been based on a planned doctrine since its formation until the former president, Ewald Alfonso, enacted free market reforms. Now the country finds itself in between two different economic systems. Promote planned economy. Also, Julia Institute is saying, wait, prologue? Haven't you been playing for ages? Yes, my previous playthrough ended with me executed by the goddamn Queen of Rumberg, and I was very upset. So now I'm restarting things, and I'm going full Stalin in what I'm calling a reign of terror, which is very funny, because the president's name is Anton Rain. Okay. Diplomacy. The intensifying global rivalry between capitalist Arcasia in the West and communist Yande Contana in the East is opening new diplomatic possibilities. Let's align with the East. Um, in recent years, Bludish, Wezek, and Agnolian immigrants flocked to Sorland due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Ewald Alfonso. 
As a result, tensions in between swords and immigrants have been increasing. Uh, we're gonna tighten immigration, I think. Or are we? Fuck. Did Stalin hate immigrants? I don't know. Uh... The communist in me is saying keep immigration relaxed. Or, no. Stalin would tighten immigration. Okay, that sucks. I'm already betraying what I like to do, but here we go. All right, term focus. Do we even need to question it? The military is getting all my focus. The military uh, protects the country from hostile threats, and while some see it as a massive financial burdens or burden, others argue it is a critical deterrent. Yes, it is. I have first-hand knowledge how critical it is. And I can only do one, right? Okay, the military has my focus. Your promises will be remembered and they will have consequences. Are you sure about your decisions? Yes, I am. Two weeks have passed since we won the election. And now I was about to be sworn in as the fourth president of Swordland. Thousands were watching the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name, Anton Rain. The die was cast. And Caleb Cherry, thanks for following. Uh, the die was cast and there my story began. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. I had no way of knowing what future awaited me there. Or do I? I looked at my family. My son and daughter, Frank and Deanna, were next to Monica, my wife. Her eyes were glimmering with pride. Then I turned towards the key people who made it all possible. Of course, each individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Orzo Hawker, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was waiting for me, and I'm gonna take notes this time. Starting with, Hawker is a jerk. Part of the old guard. Uh, okay, he's waiting for me. The time for the oath has come. I'm gonna be impatient. Let's start, old man. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear that I will respectfully execute the office of the President of Swordland and to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the people and the Constitution of the Republic of Swordland. You may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. I'm gonna be like very direct, let's say. I'm not gonna fucking thank him. I'm not gonna say it's an honor. Let's begin, let's get this shit started. Good, let's begin. Um, but I do like starting every speech with brothers and sisters. It's very communist. I think it's gonna get people to like me. Brothers and sisters. The crowd looked very eager to listen to me, as they fucking should. Uh, I'll just talk about unity. That's always good. For many generations, this country and its long history have kept us tied to an idea. The idea of unity and our people's right for a free and prosperous life. In the past, there have been times of survival, times of conflict and economic hardship too. But whenever we stood together, we prevailed. Uh, stop the recession, yeah. Turn our faces to the east, yeah. But no, the Constitution First, we must rewrite our broken constitution from 1929. Change now, not in the next decade or years, today. Hundreds of thousands cheered. They were shouting my name in unison. Oh, I oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna pretend that was applause for my speech. Damn you, Titus Mekin. You have ruined my inauguration. <laughs> Alright. Uh, <laughs> I felt the responsibility, the power and burden all at the same time. Uh, raise fist. I raised my fist in the air, which triggered a huge applause. I took a long look at the people of Swordland to burn this moment into my memory. 
One of the presidential guards came by to notify me that it was time to leave. I'm midway to the leading car in the motorcade. Okay, great. The presidential state car was a jet black Cadilla with flags of Sorland above the front headlights. Next to it, a man was holding the door. It's my old buddy, Sergey. Does he have a, uh... I want to know about him. Born in a small town of Dare. He was a truck driver. And then a police officer who didn't complete his... Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Cool, I like him. He's a good dude. Uh, still under the effect of the speech I made, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I am Sergey. You're a new driver. I'm gonna be nice to Sergey. I always like Sergey. I, I, I'm happy to be Stalin, but I'm gonna be nice to Sergey. Nice to meet you, Sergey. It's an honor. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door and gesturing inside. I entered the car. We will be heading towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Sergey proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying attention to what he was saying. He suddenly made a gesture towards the now closer palace. Isn't it a beauty? The Maroon Palace. He was right. Sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon-colored domes. It was so bright that I had to look away. Every time I look at it, I am reminded of my duty to this nation. Uh... It is in good hands now. I'm gonna be a little arrogant. I am sure of that, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stepped in front of the doors. Sergey got out of the car and opened the door for me. That's nice. Have a great day, Mr. President. A Morgna West Corps. He referred to the famous Swordish phrase from the times of the revolution. A Morgna West Corps. Vectern Sius Die. Which meant morning will come. Victory is close. Vector and Sista. I made my way upstairs through, uh, through the extravagant, uh, extravagant corridors of the palace. Marble and engraved wooden finishes decorated the interior. Huh. Bourgeoisie extravagance. Not in my, Swordland. My footsteps echoed in the colossal halls. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive doors to my new office. Okay, fuck yeah, we're back, baby. Ignolia! Congratulations from Prime Minister Van Horten. Uh, wants to continue trade partnerships. Nope, fuck you, guy. I was allied with you last time, and where'd that get me? Meanwhile, Vagasland. That's where the future's at. Chancellor Helgel sent his congratulations on her great victory and wished for close cooperation between our countries in the future. Hegel signaled concessions from Vagasland in case of a promising trade deal. He also congratulated the Swordish democracy for the successful elections and warned us about the growing threat. Okay, yep, great. These are my dudes. Okay. President Smolak has congratulated us. He wants to normalize the diplomatic situation. Okay. Lesbia! Also congratulated us and warned us, warned us about United Contana. Capitalist dogs. Okay, so what news from the capital first? Actually, let's read the news itself. Rain spoke of unity. That's accurate. President Anton Rain, the new president, has been sworn into office. Blah 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 blah. Uh. Okay. The new assembly begins duty. Communist Party and Blutia both got below 10%. Okay. Another USP president. How many times will people fall for the same trap? At least once more. Restructure the infrastructure? Yes, we will. And end Solonomics. Uh, no. Central planning's where it's at. All right, so from the capital. We have logistical issues in the whole sword. That sucks. Uh, okay, the general staff convened right after the election to congratulate our victory. All branches of the Swordish Armed Forces represented in the meeting that took place in Camp Strongarm 
with massive security measures. The Chief of the Armed Forces, Vulcan Kruger, made a public press statement highlighting the increased, in increasing chances of military confrontation in Eastern Macopa and thanked us for the promise to strengthen and support the military. Damn straight. Uh, the port of Lackhaven has lost its importance. That's not good. Lack of investment in Arbery. That's bad. And low production in England. Okay, let's do, uh, does it matter? Briefing on the current political situation. Pete Vectern arrived a couple of minutes early and sat across from me. He was struggling to hold back his smile. We did it, Anton. We won. Finally, the bribery, the backstabbing. The backstabbing, it's all paid off. Pete's eyes sparkled. The strain of the past months had put a damper on his usual rackish charm. But today he was looking and acting more like his old self. He loosened his tie and undid the top two buttons of his shirt. Okay. Enjoying the new secretary I picked out for you? Thought you'd appreciate her gorgeous set of talents. It's a shame the rest of your staff aren't as easy on the eyes. He gestured to the slight paunch that protruded over his waistband. But hey, back in university, did you ever imagine we would be sitting here in the Maroon Palace? We have to celebrate this great victory. Uh... Let's celebrate then. I got my hands on something special, just for us, and Erlroy Maroon, a 30 rolled. I opened the expensive bottle of whiskey and poured it into glasses I prepared. The exquisite smell filled the room immediately. The 1924, that was my freshman year. Also the year after the revolution. Very difficult times to be honest, but this smells like heaven. Uh, screw 1924. It is tainting this moment. Toast. I raised my glass and toasted with Pete before smelling the whiskey and taking a sip. The sweet vanilla tone combined with an oaky taste developed into a lingering smokiness. Ah, uh, yeah. Pete really seemed to be enjoying himself. Yeah, he is. What a taste! This is how we should start all meetings, Anton. We wouldn't get much done. Remember the last administration? Yeah, but we are different. They just enjoyed the privilege. We can't make the same mistakes again. We learned from it all. Yes, we did. The door swung open and Lucien Galade, my chief strategist, walked in. He was a compact man with sharp bird-like features. After briefly surveying the room from wall to wall, he sat down, poured a glass of water, and opened his briefcase in a series of quick, graceful movements. Gentlemen, the tall case clock in the room struck three o'clock. Damn, you are exactly on time. Hello, Peter. Lucian then turned towards me. He very slightly bowed his head. All right, I'm gonna be direct. That's the Stalin approach. Let's not waste any time, Lucian. Proceed with the overview. As you wish, sir. Lucian spoke in soft, clipped tones that immediately drew your attention towards what he had to say. Peeth and I waited for him to proceed. We will start the meeting by evaluating the current situation. The majority of the Swordish people demand change. They are more concerned about the economy than the Constitution, but they blame the system for their problems. People are losing their trust in our democracy. That's good. This frustration even causes some to reason with figures like Bernard A. Circas, that communist guy. It is expected that we will bring a change the last government did not. Franz Richter, leader of the reformists, believes that true change can only be done by transferring some of our powers to the assembly. I will move into the details of their demand shortly. Yeah, not a chance in hell. If we lose power as the government, we won't be able to execute necessary changes for the good of our country. And that's going to be my argument. As I consolidate power, I am always going to say it's for the good of democracy. It may create issues for us, yes. However, with the reformists gaining more popularity, we may not be in the position to stand against them. Mr. Richter managed to influence many members of the assembly to give their support for drafting a new constitution. Reformist politicians are quickly increasing in number. 
while the reformist wing inside our party is still a minority, they could have a tripartisan majority in the assembly, especially if they unite under Franz Richter. Okay. Our party must fall in line with our position in the near future. We can't have a strong divide. Our opposition would be the only one to benefit from our party divisions. Reformists' demands are clear. They want to limit the presidential veto powers, ensure that the Supreme Court is independent, and take away their right to vote on constitutional amendments. I won't allow them to influence me. We will shape our own future. I agree, sir. The Old Guard will do their best to preserve the Constitution. Chief Justice Hawker and his allied judges have a great influence over the Supreme Court, which would be tough to break. The court also has an abrupt power over constitutional legislation. Without their approval, we cannot even change it. We must break the power of the Supreme Court one way or another. Hint, hint. I agree. They have too much power over swordish politics. We need to take away their vote in constitutional legislation. It is absurd that an unelected branch gets to vote for bills. We cannot allow obstructionists to exist. We will figure it out. Our party still holds 130 out of 250 seats in the assembly. That is power. However, to reform the constitution, we must receive a two-thirds majority in the Grand National Assembly, which is 166 votes, and a simple majority in the Supreme Court that equates to six votes. Okay. After we have settled our thoughts on how to proceed, we will need to talk with our party figures. Our first goal must, to get, uh, must be to get the 150 signatures needed to start the process. Following the green light from the USP, we will reach out to the other party leaders to see if they would back our draft. And then the last step is to convince the justices of the court. The entire process will take a long time, but we must start working with our form committee to evaluate all possibilities for a new constitution as soon as possible. Uh, the new constitution should give the president wide ranging powers to lead Swordland into the future. Yes. That's very bold. Then we must start with eliminating the Supreme Court's authority over constitutional legislation, and maybe we'll take away their immunity. We also need to address the loopholes regarding the presidential vetoes to keep the balance for such an act. I will not limit my veto powers. We need them. Pete looked troubled. It will be very difficult to explain that case to the reformists taking the legislative power of the Supreme Court but holding your own absolute authority over legislation would look like a power grab. We would lose all reformist support. Uh, no matter what you say, I intend to come out of this stronger as the president. The public might be persuaded, but the reformists in the assembly are not going to fall for that. They would try to paint you as yet another strong man trying to grab more power for himself. Ah, uh, they're not wrong. I can handle them. It will be done. That would be tough, sir, but I trust your judgment. Okay, hopefully this actually doesn't end with me just dead again, but we'll see. It would be quite difficult to secure the 166 votes needed to propose such a bill. You would also be burning bridges with the reformists and the old guard. We can do it, Lucian. Look at what we accomplished so far, of course. To clarify, for, uh, to clarify before we head uh, to a direction, what are your intentions, sir? The president needs to be able to exercise his powers with ease to maintain stability. I understand. We do not have to remove your veto. Instead, we can discuss limiting it with the reformists. No, I will only support a new constitution that strengthens my position. Oh my god, I am just, uh... <laughs> going all in. Okay, very well. Work will begin to explore how to realistically pass such a constitutional change. 
We will form a reform committee and start talking with all stakeholders in the assembly and the court to see if such changes to the constitution will be possible. More information about how we will balance the clauses of the new constitution and reform contents will be available later this year. Lucian took notes. Another important point, we must be aware of the Lotharberg group. The oligarchs convene under this organization to influence economic policies. Conrath led it for a long time. Uh, according to reports, some members of the National Business Council are in their pockets. The group, under the leadership of Walter Tusk, will surely try to bribe us for their special economic interests. Uh, we won't let these privileged, greedy, and snobby capitalists run the country. Let's not underestimate their influence. These are not harmless people either. Lucien looked at Pete. As far as I know, Marcel, or Marcel, Con hey, that's my name. Marcel, nice. Uh, Corradi has some strong ties to this group, and we may try using his influence if we deem it necessary. He will want something from us for sure. Uh, that group is dependent on our economic policies. They can't move a finger without us. I wouldn't be so optimistic. The capital they represent could damage the country significantly if it was to be diverted away. We need to tread carefully on all sides with all power players to survive our term. I need to underline the seriousness of the situation. Our election campaign promised to focus on the military. This was a safe choice. The military and the general staff is a powerful element in the state, and as history tells us, a dangerous one too. Uh, the military can be close allies, and with the Rumberg threat on the horizon, we need them. Rumberg is a massive threat, one that also requires us to ally with other stronger nations. Defense Minister Josef Lancia is more loyal to us compared to General Kruger, a fact that obviously can change with our actions. Either way, I see a potential rift between the two since they are clearly of different minds. If we act strongly against the military, the two will unite against us. I agree with Lucian. We need to tread carefully. Well, I'm not going to work against the military, so it's a moot point. Well then, gentlemen, precisely 30 minutes. This concludes our political briefing for today. Our next meeting will be about our media strategy. Talk to you soon, sir. I will keep in touch. Awesome. All right, what's in the news? A committee for reforms. Yes, I love democracy. Support an assembly grows for campaign finance bill. Swordish National League start season, whatever. Rumberg coming south? You better believe it. Okay, increasing homelessness in Dare. And while we're at it here, let's check out what's going on in the government. So, got a reform committee. Let's focus on military. Military interference in politics, outdated military equipment, internal security jurisdiction, large reservist pool, experienced generals. Okay. Romberg's military is overwhelming. Magnolia's military is weak. Bogsland military is strong. Lesbia is strong. And Wellen is weak. Okay, great. Uh, public opinion. People's views on the need for democratic reform in the government structure has changed over the last decade. Reformist propaganda from the leader of the People's Freedom and Justice Party have resulted in a massive increase in the... Okay, yeah. So people want democracy. I'll give them democracy. <laughs> All right, current economic situation. Simon Hull, Gus Manger, and Lilia Scraff were about to arrive at the White Room for a scheduled economy meeting. This was the room in the Maroon Palace where all important meetings were held. Two assistants arrived first, carrying a heavy projector. They stood with it by the door, waiting for the ministers to enter. From the hallway, I heard Lilius's Scraff voice. Who is this lady? 
She's the Minister of the Interior. Okay. I think this is the person who betrayed me in my first playthrough, so we gotta keep an eye on her. All right. Uh, Gus, do you really think that such an economically advanced area is in more need of investment than England? Lilius, my interior minister, strode in. She was clad in shades of brown and beige. The only spot of color, a bright yellow nearest star on her necklace. Gus followed close behind. Okay, don't be an idiot, Lilius. What about the unemployment crisis the Greater Holsword and Gelsland regions are going through? These areas are economic heartland. A master thief Esquire, 100 bits saying, don't believe her lies, she is the one. Yeah. I, yeah, she was the one who betrayed me last time and, and stole the party from me. It was a whole thing. Uh, Gus curled his hands into fists. The Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development's temper hadn't changed since his days in the Alfonso administration, but neither had his reputation for getting things done. His far-reaching network of connections was unlike any other. Simon Hall quickly stepped between the two ministers. Without looking at either of them, he cleared his throat. Good morning, Mr. President. What is this debate about? Just a disagreement in the internal economic strategy, President Rain. Not sure if I would call it just a disagreement, Lilius. Let's begin the presentation. I'm not taking sides in this bullshit. Yes, I will move forward my presentation if no one objects. Please. Go ahead. Simon pulled out a silk handkerchief out of his pocket and briefly wiped his glasses. My staff and I comprehensively analyzed every aspect of... Okay. He was interrupted by a groan from one of the assistants by the door, both of whom were now visibly struggling to hold up the heavy projector. Oh, you can put that there. He pointed below the painting of President Soul. The assistants placed the projector next to the table and installed a white screen on the wall. Leave now. I mean, thank you, and please leave now. The assistants left the cabinet room. I was reminded that Simon had never quite had a way with people, but his facility with numbers, or faculty, or whatever, facility with numbers had made him the most sought after economic specialist in Swordland. Simon started looking for his slides. He always carried documentation around with him. Uh, I guess I'll wait. Like, yawning is... No, I, you don't want to little people in front of others. That's uh, probably what Stalin would have done, but I want effectiveness in the government, please. Uh, Simon, what happened to the new police station construction in Elstord? While going through his briefcase, he paused for a moment to answer. It got stalled due to a government property boundary issue. I've been meaning to look at it. I can take a look at that one. Elstord needs all the security help it can get. Sure, more time for me to spend on analysis, okay. As long as everyone's happy. His eyes glittered when he finally found the slides he was looking for. There have been some developments about the Swordish Ren losing further value today. We have been trying to stabilize it with the central bank. Yeah, maybe they're like buying up GameStop uh, stocks. I, I think I vaguely remember about this. Okay. The recession of 51 put enormous pressure on the economy, resulting in the collapse of the value of our currency. The entire situation was a significant cause of concern for our administration. What would you like to know about the current economic situation? Uh, what's its status, I guess? Okay, minus 6% recession, blah, 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 the GDP's dropped. It's looking bad. Our success depends on our ability to stop the recession. Okay, uh... I'm gonna skip this. This doesn't mean anything to me. I have all the information needed. I'm just gonna pretend I'm a fucking genius. Let's move on to the economic strategy. Simon scattered the paper stack in front of him in an orderly manner and took a final look at his notes before clearing his throat. As you can see, the situation is alarming, but not everything is negative. The extension and privatization program of Alfonso left us a large budget surplus, which we can use to stabilize the crisis. Okay. The primary subject we need to settle on is what general path we will take in our term. Solonomics based nationalization happened in the 30s, and Alfonso's privatization began during the end of the 40s. What will our administration focus on? One of our main promises was to promote a planned economy to stop the recession. To be frank, I still don't think this was a good idea. 
We shouldn't go back to Solonomics. It's the reason of the recession. Self-sufficiency will get us through tough times, blah, 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 blah. The more of the economy we control, the better we can manage the recession. That's a fair argument to be made, but if you reduce the freedom of the people in the marketplace in general, it would hinder our innovation and dynamism in the supply and whatever. Say what you want about Alfonso. Without his attempts, our current coffers would be empty and the recession would be a depression. One way to be remembered positively is to cause a recession and leave a few bills behind, okay? The structural problems of Solonomics were going to lead to a recession according to the predictions at the time anyway. Either way, even if we pick one of the doctrines, we retain the option to make economic choices on a case-by-case -case basis. That is, however, not recommended in my point of view. The last thing we need is a chaotic economic plan. Okay, whatever. Uh, the superpowers are going to get involved, depending on what we do here. Uh... Economically speaking, we aren't as tied to United Contana as we are to Arcasia, so a decision to align to the east is much more difficult to accomplish. We must be very cautious. There are schemes being devised about Swordland. We cannot give in to their wants now or in the future, otherwise our country will turn into a pawn. I want you to reconsider your promise to align with United Contana. Uh... Yeah, the revolution, this is strong, but I don't want to admit it in front of anybody. I'm just going to say, don't worry, I won't let United Contana control Swordland. I hope we can show and not tell. When the time comes, I hope we'll make the right decision for your own good, or for our own good. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Minister Wheezy will be in charge of informing you of those types of foreign policy decisions. We must first decide our internal economic plan. Um, uh, we have to thank Sol and his planned economy for the boom. It clearly shows the success of the system. Yeah, Lilius, you like that? Ah, precisely the reason why we should stick to the old system. State planning and regulation both showed great success in the 30s. Only for a limited time, until even Tarkin Sol himself discovered the limits of the system. The slowdown began during his rule, remember? Um, wouldn't a planned economy focus bring us stronger allies? United Contana will like it. Arcasia won't. Let's move on. What are your final thoughts then, Mr. President? Critical institutions must remain in state control. You must be fully responsible in delivering services. If you could be in, it wouldn't be negative, but either way, you make the choice. Yeah, whatever. So what will our general economic plan promote? Promote a planned economy, as we promised. Not sure if you made the right decision here. Gus looked worried. Now that there is clarity on which direction we are heading, I will work on a good plan accordingly. This concludes our meeting. Hell yeah. Alright, what's in the news? Economy meeting held, yep. Freezing temperatures recorded, that's bad. Nationalist violence, those bastards. And pioneering electronics, great. Increase, uh, increasing unemployment in Morna. Bad infrastructure in Gelsord. And bad infrastructure in Lenkurg. Promising agricultural growth in Sarna. Okay, that's something. Alright, two things on the agenda. We got a media strategy meeting and a mega structure thing. So we'll do media first. Lucian and Pete arrived at my office to talk about recent developments and the media strategy. They both took their seats across from me. Lucian put on his reading glasses and quickly went over some documents. Pete turned to Lucian and nodded. Let's begin. First of all, Lucian, you mentioned that Marcel Karate, Karate contacted you. This is... Okay, the largest ever... This is one of those oligarch son of a... Yeah, fuck that guy. Okay, don't like him. 
The Corantis had always been known as one of the richest and most influential families in Sorland. Marcel Coranti was no exception. He was the oldest son of Conrad Coranti, the industrialist and media mogul who founded HOS, which is part of Sorland. The richest man in the entirety of Sorland. I'm gonna crush him. I'm gonna fucking crush him. Lucian turned to me. He has offered to be with you, Mr. President. What does he want? After the passing of his father, may he rest in peace, Marcel aims to become the next CEO of the HOS conglomerate. He mentioned a productive collaboration. They are a powerful and influential media conglomerate. To start with, they own the Swordland Today newspaper, the Swordish Broadcasting Corporation, which means it'd be wise to have them by our side. Sorry for interrupting. What does this productive collaboration entail? He did not wish to explain the details over the phone, but rather in person. I believe I'll be receiving a call from him sometime soon. However, as Pete said, they have substantial power over the content of media outlets, headlines, radio shows. That is what he would be offering. What he wants in return is what we need to understand, okay? But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, we need to determine our approach to media. I have far less expertise in the matter, but very interesting arguments were made by Lucien at the preparation meeting yesterday. There are two ways we can approach the media. One of them is by influencing it, which has clear advantages, and the other one is keeping it independent. The media is a tool to be used. I agree. Media plays a huge role in adapting public opinion towards our views and policies. While I do acknowledge this will sound a bit harsh, I certainly believe that we possess the perspective, knowledge, and experience to have the superior judgment compared to a normal citizen living his daily life. Damn straight. We need to protect those idiot citizens from their own opinions. I share your opinion. I concur. Even if we don't use it, let us have control over it. You are all aware of my certain expertise with public opinion swing. I will make sure the media is on our side. Okay. Two knocks were heard on the door. Who is it? It's Livia, Mr. President. Livia Suno, my new secretary, entered the office. Her dark curls bounced as she crossed the room to my desk. She spoke with a slight lilt in her voice. Excuse me, Mr. President. Mr. Galate's secretary has been calling me and wanted me to relay a message. Marcel Karate, the new CEO for HOS Conglomerate, is on the line for Mr. Galade. Well, the ball is in our court now. Would you like to talk to him, sir, or would you like me to? I'll talk to him. Connect the line to my office. Right away, sir. Connecting the line, or connecting the call to line one. Livia left the room, and the phone started ringing. Pick up the phone. I'm gonna be nice. It's a pleasure, Mr. Karate. The pleasure is all mine. I know your time is valuable, so I will not waste any of it. I was just elected to be the CEO of HOS. My strategy is the running of this conglomerate will be different from my father's approach. This is why I'm offering a partnership deal regarding our media branch. I would like to formally invite you to my resort near Conriat for a meeting to discuss the details. Ooh. Thank you for the offer. I would be so interested in a meeting with you. You will not be disappointed, I promise. Well then, I will let you return to your packed schedule. See you later, Mr. President. See you later, Mr. Karate. I hung up the phone. I'll set things up right away. Expect a worthwhile meeting next month. It's settled then, looking forward to the meeting next month. Okay, great. Lucien looked at his watch. Looks like we're out of time for today. We'll continue where we left off. Thanks for your time, great. Uh, see you soon, gentlemen. Lucien and Pete gathered their documents and promptly left my office. We were already getting the attention of key and potentially dangerous figures. Uh, not as dangerous as me, motherfuckers. Okay, what's in the news? Conrath Karate passed away. Fuck that guy. Glamorous inauguration ball, which I think is obscene, but I am forced to attend it. Uh, Swordland's Regional Trade. Okay. 
Infrastructure. Uh, we're going to invest in an infrastructure project. That's Planned Economy 101. <laughs> Campaign Finance Bill. Uh, okay, so basically this is saying if I sign this, the USP's budget will be doubled, and I'm going to remove the parties that failed to hit that 10% threshold, the Communists and the Blutish Freedom Party, whatever they're called. I'm going to sign it. Yeah, I'm going to double my own party's budget. I need that money. That's going to piss off somebody. Electoral funding reform. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. USP hijacks elections. No, I didn't. I'm trying to save democracy. You're just ignorant. Okay, uh, meanwhile, on the Constitution front, the Reform Committee reports that any potential change to the Constitution that will result in the expansion of executive powers will likely result in strong opposition from the People's Freedom and Justice Party. Fuck them. I don't care about them. Discussion of the potential infrastructure projects. The view towards the Markian Sea from Lakiven was nothing short of exquisite. The seaside state residence, fittingly named the Blue Mansion, was large, fine, and accommodating. But enjoying the luxurious mansion wasn't the main reason for our visit. We gathered the economic team here to discuss the new infrastructure investment projects. Half an hour had already passed since the start of the meeting. Unfortunately, I did not even have the chance to have my usual afternoon coffee. Outrageous! Looking at the view from the windows, I, left, I let my mind drift for a couple of seconds. Simon's voice brought me back into the ongoing discussion. Mr. President, we need to focus on boosting the economy as quickly as possible. One of the fastest ways to achieve this is through infrastructure projects. Agreed. On the one hand, businessmen are complaining about the slow logistical rail network between Holsort and Lackavan. On the other hand, citizens are criticizing the lack of a proper highway connection between Lakavin and Arvory. The narrow roads by the seaside are not only dangerous, but difficult to traverse. We need to pick the most profitable option for economic growth. That's just uh, uh, common sense. Which is obviously connecting our two most economically powerful cities. It is not the business people that suffer, but the ordinary folk. What really matters, though, is that we accomplish something tangible in your first economic act. We must prove our administrative capabilities that people must know that this administration can get things done. Therefore, I defined two important projects for your attention. The H3 Highway Project and the L1 High Speed Railway Project. Okay, the Ministry can only support one project at a time with the current capacity and budget. Let's move on to the details of each. So, what one do you want to hear about? And first, let's do... I think I've already made my choice. Last time we did the highway project, this time I'm going to do high-speed rail. I have some reasons for this, but let's, let's hear their arguments first. Um, your predecessor, Alfonso, has failed in delivering this campaign promise but we can start the construction of this groundbreaking railway project. As you know, our current trains cannot meet the standards of today. As many other countries adopt this uh, new electric engine technology to power up their trains, we fall one step behind. Reports about the newest trains in the United Montana traveling at incredible speeds has piqued the business interest. They too want to transport resources and material from Holsort to Lakavin with great speed and efficiency. Major cities of Sorland need more infrastructure to, to support their growing population. This should be our priority, growth and development optimism, our optimization. Our plan is to upgrade the old L1 line from Holsor to Lakavan. It will transform to a high-speed rail. Look at the map. Holsor to Lakavan, the two most important cities in Sorland. The planned construction starts right here at the capital. It will go to Anrika first, and then to Lakavan, or to Gelsord. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. The L1 will significantly boost the economy 
uh, on the newly linked cities and even the rural areas in between. Lakaven is our primary port, so the goods unloaded there will be transported to Whole Sword much faster. And thanks to Alvroko for following. Uh, yes, we should link these rural areas in the middle with the major cities. I believe this would benefit the businesses and Sorland as a whole. For wealthy and middle class citizens of those regions, but not for the poor deers who would, wouldn't be able to afford the increased ticket prices. Uh, the mayor of Enrica, Curtin Leste, also requested this project to be prioritized. Uh, businessmen in the region will be very content, uh, which increased blah, 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 blah. So they're recommending the high speed. I've settled on a decision. We're doing the rail. I have decided on the L1 high speed rail project to improve the connection between our most productive cities. That's the right choice, Mr. President. Great. Is there anything else? That's just, that's it. Okay, great. So I don't like the idea of uh, connecting our northernmost province when that's going to be where Rumberg might invade from. Also, I have to support the cities. That's where the power is. My heart goes out to the poor folks in the rural lands, but uh, fuck them. Invest in Arcasian company stocks. I don't see why not. I mean, I missed out on the chance to buy GameStop shit, so I might as well do whatever this place is called. Electronics Manufacturing. I didn't do this last time, so I want to know what happens. Maybe I'm going to lose all my money. Who can say? Okay. Reception at the inaugural ball. I had just finished buttoning up my suit jacket when the doorbell rang. The presidential guard had arrived to pick us up for the inaugural ball. The ball was a three-decade-old tradition, breathlessly anticipated by politicians, bureaucrats, and the press. All eyes were about to be on me. I called on Monica to get the children ready. Looking in the mirror, I straightened my tie and took a deep breath. After tonight, there would be no turning back. Suddenly, Deanna hugged me from behind, startling me a little. Monica had fixed her hair into an elaborate braid, woven through with ribbons. Papa! Mama told me it's time to go! Yeah, no shit. Uh... Hello, darling. Where is your brother? I think Frank is still upstairs. She shrugged. It was almost time to leave. The big ball was starting in less than an hour. Uh... Now, ah, where's my first lady? Monica came down the stairs. She was wearing a simple yet elegant beige sheath dress and short heels. Her hair had been neatly pinned into a chignon, I guess, showing off the pearl earrings I had given her for our 15th anniversary. All those years, she had stayed by my side. Now, we were about to begin the most challenging chapter in our lives yet. How do you do, Mr. President? I'm gonna embrace her. Monica, my love, you look as gorgeous as the day we married. Now there's that charm that got you elected. Frank trudged down the stairs. This thing itches. Frank tugged at the collar of his new tuxedo. He seemed ill at ease. I know I said I'm going to be Stalin, but only to my enemies, not to my family. I'm glad to have you with us for this big night. Sure, Dad, I'm just dying to go. Papa, are these people going to be around us from now on? She pointed to the presidential guards at the door of the house. Uh, these people are our friends, Deanna. It's all right, baby. They're here to make sure nothing bad happens to your papa or his family. Monica held Deanna's hand. Together, flanked by the guards, we walked out the door. Halfway to the car, Frank stopped abruptly and turned towards me. Dad, do I really have to go? Couldn't I stay home instead? Uh... I am nervous myself, Frank, but I'd feel a lot more confident with my son by my side. Frank smiled reluctantly. Well, when you put it like that, sure, let's go. 
The presidential guard showed us the way as red and blue lights flashed around us. Sergei, my driver, ushered us into our armed limousine. Armored, I should say. The motorcade started moving towards the palace. I gazed out the window, deep in thought. Anton, what are you thinking about? I was thinking that we've come a long way together, haven't we? Yes, we have. And there's still so much that we'll accomplish side by side. Just remember, no matter what happens, the children and I will always be here for you, huh? I'm gonna help Papa fix everything. Shut up, Deanna! I'm tired of your bullshit. Frank rolled his eyes. Good for you, Frank. I know you will, honey. Uh, I'm gonna stay silent. I'm not gonna support my daughter's stupid shit. After what seemed like just a few minutes, the convoy slowed to a halt. Sergey rolled down the limousine's soundproof partition. We are here, sir. Hope you enjoy the drive. Much appreciated. How are you today? I am just as good as I can be, but today is your day, sir. I'm glad you are in charge now. You know, my entire family voted for you. I won't let your family down, Sergey. I don't doubt that, sir. You were the one who sparked a glimmer of hope in us all. Okay. Now that all the more reason not to have the country blown up by Rumberg. Sergey opened the doors for me. The normally imposing palace was festooned with garish banners that nearly made it look cheerful. A line of shiny luxury sedans stretched around it. Okay. Politicians, bureaucrats, and celebrities. The creme de la creme of the Swordland elite streamed inside the building. I hate everyone here. Good luck out there, Mr. President. I'll see you on the trip home, Sergey. I stepped out and immediately found myself surrounded by loud voices and camera flashes. Hordes of eager journalists thrust their portable microphones my way. My guards fended most of them off, but one woman managed to dodge them and corner me. I recognized the Swordish Broadcasting Company logo on her press lanyard. Mr. President, Mr. President, do you plan on working together with the opposition parties on the expected constitutional reforms? I'm going to work with everybody. I love democracy so much. Mr. Richter clarified that as long as you support their demands of democrat democratization, democratize, God damn it, I can do this. Democratization. Democratization. Democratization, that's it. Democrat. Demo whatever, fuck it. Democratization. They will work with you on all issues with a cooperative spirit. What do you think about this statement? I welcome it. This is a challenge for us all. One more question. One of your first acts as president was to sign a campaign finance law allocating public election funds by seats in the assembly as opposed to number of votes. Is this a deliberate attempt to defund the Communist Party and the Bludio Workers Party, neither of which have reached the election threshold? I've had it with your questions, guards! <laughs> That's enough, ma'am, said one of my guards while nudging the reporter away from me. A path through the crowd was now open, and we quickly made our way to the entrance of the palace. At the same time, a dozen fireworks went off. The entrance was decorated with beautiful ribbons in Swordland's colors of white, yellow, and maroon. A lush maroon carpet had been rolled down the stairs. We entered the lobby and joined the throngs of people making their way towards the ballroom. Behind me, I heard a familiar voice. There they are, the most beautiful family in Swordland. Uncle Pete! Hi, Uncle. Hi, Uncle Pete. It's great to see you. You two are growing faster than I am getting wiser. Are you sure you've gotten any wiser, Pete? Ha ha ha, we're a, we're a fun bunch. Maybe not. After all, I'm still sticking with you. Happy to see a familiar face. Pete, Evelyn. Pete's wife, Evelyn, approached us and shook her hands with a firmness that belied her delicate features. Congratulations, Anton. I have to say, the results were clear to me from the beginning. Uh, thank you. We both worked hard to make it happen. We know you did. You deserve the position. And tonight, we reap the rewards. 
We could start by getting some drinks. You read my mind. Pete grinned and beckoned a roving waiter. The four of us each took a glass of champagne. Monica, how are you? You've barely said a word. I am more than relieved to have this roller coaster ride over with, but of course, now the real work begins. Ah, yes. Managing the help, planning parties, daily trips to the salon to look your best for foreign dignitaries. Don't be so old fashioned, Devlin. I plan to use my power as First Lady to advance the position of women throughout Swordland. Equal rights for our sex are long overdue, wouldn't you say, Anton? As long as I don't burn the roast. Uh. Absolutely. And we'll work together to achieve that. Monica flashed me a smile. Deanna suddenly jumped in between us and tugged on my sleeve. Papa, can we go? I want to see the ballroom. Uh. Yes, it's time. Let's go. I guess I'll be nice to my daughter. Fine. We left the lobby and made our way towards the ballroom. Inside, we were yet again surrounded by a noisy crowd, but this time it was the politicians who sought to appease the new authority in Swordland. I spent the next few hours shaking hands, joining various conversations, some serious, some superficial, and making speeches. We finally settled down at our dinner table with the Vecterns as the band started playing some slow jazz tunes. Oof, that was tiring. Another drink? Well, suddenly a loud banging noise echoed from outside the ballroom, then another one and another. The musicians stopped playing, everyone in the room was looking around in confusion. Pete and I turned towards each other, realizing a realization dawning on both our faces. Biowex? No, gunshots! As soon as Monica heard the word, she lunged from her seat. I'm gonna shield Monica and the kids. I threw myself on Monica, Deanna, and Frank to shield them. Papa, what's happening? I knew it. We never should have gone. Gone where? To the government? Uh, chaos broke out as some guests flung themselves under the table, and others ran towards the doors. Screaming, uh, Deanna burst into tears while Frank tried to comfort her, hiding the fear in his own eyes. Three more gunshots rang out loudly. Oh my god. Mr. Oh, uh, thanks to FDR's legs <laughs> for following. I was hoping to get the rest of him, but the legs will have to suffice. Mr. President, are you all right? Carl Greaser, head of the Swordish Police Force, was running towards us with three more police officers in decorated uniforms. They all had their guns drawn. As soon as he made it to us and saw that we were unharmed, he let out a big sigh of relief. Thank God. What the hell is going on? One second, Mr. President. He turned around quickly to his men. Check the perimeter, now! Paul, Jensen, follow my lead. We will bring them to the safe room. He now turned to Monica, Evelyn, and the children and spoke in a softer voice. Do not worry. The situation is now under control. Please follow me. We promptly followed Carl through the winding halls and corridors of the palace. His men still had their guns drawn, which did nothing to ease the tension. On the way, Pete made an attempt to break the silence. What a fucking night. It's not over yet. Carl turned to us with a serious face as he brought around a corner. Quiet, please. Sorry, I talk when I get nervous. Pete, shut up! Okay. Carl flipped a switch on the wall and a panel opened revealing a hidden staircase leading to a large reinforced door. Inside, a set of emergency lights flickered on. The safe room was comfortable and spacious, with expensive-looking leather sofas. Uh, small security monitors on the wall displayed grainy footage of each room. In the palace, there was a boardroom and a pantry containing about enough provisions to last us for months. Monica and Evelyn sat the children down and started wiping their tears. Okay. Carl stepped away from us and made a few radio calls. When he was done, he returned to me and Pete. Not the best inauguration ball I've been to. I'm gonna be like a funny version of Stalin, I guess. Pete let out a nervous laugh. Certainly not, sir. Carl's radio suddenly cracked life with every second felt like an eternity as he pressed his ear to the receiver. When it fell silent, he turned to us. Good news. We are not in any danger at the moment. The situation has been dealt with and the perimeter has been secured by the guards and the police. He glanced towards Monica, Evelyn, and the kids. If I may, sir. 
He gestured towards a more private corner of the room and started speaking more quietly. This is what we know so far. We have confirmed that two people were gunned down in front of the palace. The gunman is one of them, and we are sure he was working alone. The attacker fired three shots at an MP, one to the head, two to the body, instantly killing him. Okay. Presidential guards of the palace immediately shot and killed the attacker. The gunman has not been identified yet and will require an investigation. The MP that was killed was identified as Bernard Circas. Uh, it's that communist guy. This is you, Janton. This will cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Pete pulled out two cigarettes and handed me one. He then turned to Evelyn. I could hear him trying to reassure her that everything was going to be all right. Monica was still trying to tend to Deanna as Frank paced the room, mumbling that he should have stayed home. Pete, old friend, what the hell have we gotten ourselves into? Nothing you and I can't handle, Anton. I lit my cigarette and took a deep drag. We were going to see this through. At all costs, I crushed the cigarette on the ashtray. Damn straight. Rain welcomes Richter's words. MP shot. Nation in shock. One of these headlines is kind of more important than the other, but whatever. Uh, security increased in whole sword, okay. A emergency meeting in the Situation Room. Alright. I <laughs> said so the Golden Sky Cat saying, not Bernard, not again. Yeah, that, I think that man might be fated to die. I have no way to do a save Bernard playthrough. Okay. My cabinet members were gathered to discuss the shooting outside the palace. Lilius presented the initial report. Bernard Circas was shot at 9.03 p.m. in front of the palace gates. He was an elected independent member of the assembly, and as you know, a famous communist. She spat out the last word with some distaste. The guards at the scene were 15 meters away and immediately took action by responding and killing the assailant, who was identified as the member of the nationalist organization Young Swords. The president and his family were unharmed, praise God. Uh, an MP shot near the palace? That is, that is absolutely unacceptable. I agree. We are reevaluating our security measures, however, the recession has affected my ministry negatively. This sets a dangerous atmosphere where the left versus right political violence of the 1920s might spark once again. A return to those days would be devastating. The coups are the reason why our country stagnated for a decade. Nia Morgna, the Minister of Justice, sighed. The Red Youth has condemned the killing, but didn't stop there. They promised revenge. This will in turn spark further aggression from the Young Swords. The whole cycle started because Bernard Circas expressed his views. We can't simply look away. Okay, uh, Nia had always been one of the only members of the... Yeah, okay. Uh, freedom of expression is a part of our constitution. We can't have anyone, let alone an MP shot for voicing different opinions. Uh, nah, fuck the young swords. Kind of. Okay, the nationalist young swords have overstepped and they should be put under the loop for such extreme action. This is not a simple overstep, but an attack on our country. Murder for political opinions is a thing of the past. Our administration is building something new. Agreed, we will reach out to the NFP and request them to calm the situation with the Young Swords. The two groups have ties, and Mr. Kibner sees reason after all. Which can't be said about the Young Swords at times. MKFG saying, freedom of expression is a part of our constitution? Can't have that. Yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Free speech must be destroyed. Okay. Minister of Defense, Yosef Lancia, grunted in disapproval. He towered over the rest of us in full military uniform, his many war medals conspicuous on, or conspicuously on display. All due respect, ma'am. 
but shouldn't we be quick to jump on but we shouldn't be quick to jump on conclusions without having a full investigation concluded. We should refrain from making the issue a political one from the start. It will only add fuel to the fire. It is political though, isn't it? Yes, but we need to calm the country. If we take sides, we can escalate the situation further. There aren't many sides, the state versus its enemies. Damn straight, Yosef. Several police cars rushed past the Maroon Palace and everyone went silent. Regardless, a full investigation on all involved parties is underway. We will find these subversives and punish them soon enough, Mr. President. I will do my best to help coordinate the administrative tasks. Justice will be served and the rule of law will return to this country stronger than ever. Only if we stay vigilant as a country, we must think about the upcoming budget. Uh, I agree. Internal stability must be maintained. Our security funding might need to be increased. Uh, I, I think what Bernard, what he truly would have wanted, is for us to use his death as an excuse to start the KGB. So that's what we're going to do. I am sure the Ministry of Interior has already taken the necessary precautions. You can be assured that our police units and intelligence units are on increased threat condition. Nobody should be able to move a finger against government officials. Lucian took some notes after checking the latest news. Okay, great. It seems that the tensions between the communists and nationalists will escalate further. It will be very difficult to pass any meaningful change if there is chaos in the country. We can't fix the recession if there isn't stability. No, we can't pass any constitutional reforms in such an atmosphere. Okay. No use worrying about it now. Let's analyze the effects first. We will cross that bridge when we come to it. This will be it for today, then. We will convene again soon. Thank you all, and keep us updated. Okay. So a lot going on. What do we got? Murder at the palace. You hate to see it. All right, next turn. A few days later. All right, what's in the news? A Swordish politician shot dead. Yep. Unity despite differences. Murder was a method of the past. Farewell, Bernard Circas. Okay. The only way out of recession is bailing out businesses. Fuck you, no it's not. Uh, Communist Party leader suspected of bomb attack. Weapons seized in cultural center. Illegal firearms found at a Communist Party office. Police overburdened and estored. Police understaffed. Young Swords, youth wing leader dead after terror attack. So every, the country's killing itself. Illegal KA-74 seized. Uh, God damn it. So, the nationalists don't like the communists. What else is new? Meanwhile, in Ignolia has criticized the trade and balance between our two countries. Okay, well, fuck that guy. I wasn't elected president of Ignolia. All right. Uh, and BFF activity. In the, so, the Bluetooth Freedom Front is working in whole sword. Okay. Uh... Security briefing on the threats against Swordland seems right. I arrived in front of the doors leading to the situation room. Today's security briefing was arranged in two parts, starting with internal matters and moving on to external matters after a short break. The Minister of Interior, Lilius Graf, and the Minister of Justice and Law, Nia Morgna, would join us for the first part, the law enforcement briefing. For the second part, we got the Chief of the Armed Forces and the Minister of Defense. Makes sense. I opened the door. Lucian, Nia, and Lilius rose from their seats. Sir. Let's begin. Right to the point. 
Uh, everyone in the room sat down except for Lucian. He put on his glasses and went through the documents in front of him. Shortly after, he raised his head to address the attendees. Mr. President, ladies, we will kick off today's meeting with the internal security briefing. I am assuming everyone has already been over the agenda. We all have busy schedules, so without further ado, I will jump into our first topic. As we feared, the political atmosphere has worsened. Uh, the reports around the country indicate that tensions are rising, as we feared. What is the status on the Bernard Circas investigation? Okay. So what happened? Uh, we have confirmed the intention and also the events leading up to the shooting. A few days prior, members of the Red Youth initiated a violent attack on a Young Swords local leader in Jen. We believe the Young Swords then called for revenge, leading to the death of Mr. Circus. Okay. Since he often spoke against the Young Swords and nationalist sentiments in the Assembly, he was a big target, not to mention his radical communist views. Uh... Political violence needs to stop. I'm going to take the middle little road here. Yes, we've kept it at bay for so long, but it seems that there are now new triggers. Lilius handed over the report and pointed at a highlighted section in the document. The investigation revealed a very troubling fact. The funding sources of the Red Youth have a clear link to the United Montana. Uh... Are you sure? Yes, we have found the cash trail. Several Red Youth members with ties to United Contana have been detained, and the information extracted from them points to a preparation for a communist uprising in Swordland. It isn't unusual for the superpowers to influence other nations, but I think this case is a little far-fetched. The left lacks popular support in Swordland. Nia lifts her hand. I went over the report in detail. It would be wrong to jump to conclusions about a clear foreign interference, yet... Uh, okay, yet... United Contana has humanitarian and cultural ties with many countries, including Swordland. I also don't want to jump to conclusions immediately. We shouldn't create a crisis with them. Yes, okay. Nearly three decades ago, they funded General Ricard and tried to establish a communist dictatorship in our country. If it was not for Colonel Sol, we would have seen the real crisis. Our police chief, Carl Greaser, has linked the funding channel to the United Contana Consulate in Benfi. As we all know, the enemies of Swordland are many, but we also have threats inside the country. We need to... remain vigilant. That seems safe. If we give up essential freedoms to purchase temporary security, we deserve neither freedoms nor security. That's debatable. <laughs> but yes, we know what more security and surveillance caused to this country under President Sol. Let's not forget that President Sol, God bless him, brought stability after a period of bloodshed and chaos. We're moving on. Our highest internal threat comes from the estimated 20,000 strong Bluetooth Freedom Front led by the imprisoned Dewilan Arge. They are a banned political organization, now a militant force that is trying to incite racial violence. Uh, are they supported by our Bluetooth citizens? To some extent, luckily they couldn't attract a wide audience of Bluetooth, but they could potentially attract thousands if anti Bluetooth sentiment spreads in Swordland again. Lilius pointed to a page three in the report. So they're getting weapons, we know this. Okay. Rumberg has been acting aggressively in the region for a long time. I am not surprised that they would attempt to weaponize the Bluetooth people against us. This is worrying, very worrying. Okay, uh... We can't let anyone meddle with our internal stability. Our security services are doing their best to prevent further attempts. This is grave news, but we must be careful not to stoke the fires of anti bluter sentiment. What is the second most important threat? Uh, gang violence in Nargis and England. Eh, whatever. Why can't we just arrest them? The primary reason is deception and corruption that infiltrated several government offices in the police. Okay. They are playing with fire. I want them gone for good. While I agree it would make Swordland a better place, it will not be easy. These gangs exist because corruption is so common in our country, 
they buy our police officers and slip by checkpoints. A lot of bullshit going on. I shall be honest with you. With our current capabilities, we may not be able to prevent the further arming of separatists while maintaining order in Bergia, Nargis, and England. If the law enforcement budget isn't increased, I can't be fully responsible for what happens. Our police units are spread thin as is. In light of this information, I might increase the law enforcement budget. Although, Stalin would say this, You will do your job whatever happens. Don't come to me with excuses. My job is to keep you fully informed, and this is the reality. My experience and expertise in keeping your country safe from violent thugs can only go so far. I wish you'd stop using the word thugs. The real problem is corruption. A higher budget could help us end that. Your ministry must tackle the issue with persistence, Miss Morgana. Uh, we are, but it needs all the attention it can get from our administration. Okay, so they don't like each other. Well, this concludes the topics for the internal portion. Thank you for the updates, Miss Graf, Miss Morgana. Let's move on. Have a good day. Until next time. All right, now we got the external threats. Upon invitation, Yosef Lancia, along with the three high-ranking officials from the Ministry of Defense, walked into the room. One of the men was none other than General Kruger, the chief of the armed forces. Yosef made his way towards the table, while the others stood by the door. Mr. President, let's begin. I brought General Kruger with me due to the escalations on our borders. Okay, he's threatening in his 70s, second most decorated officer in Swordland, and the longest uh, serving. I'll salute him. He smiled at the gesture and bowed his head in respect. Yosef tapped his foot impatiently. He seemed uneasy with the presence of another high-ranking officer in the room. Gentlemen, thanks for coming to the significant gathering. Let's begin. Yosef and Valken took their seats at the table while the rest of the officers stood by the door. Okay. Mr. President, the situation at the western and northern borders towards Rumberg is very tense. We are observing deployments of divisions uh, closer to our border. Rumberg has been acting increasingly expansionist in the past decades and also in interfered in Agnolia, but now they have turned their sights on us. What is your current strategy? Patrolling close to the borders with our border force and keeping army reserve divisions near. It seems like they want to increase the pressure both externally and internally. Mr. President, if I may. Go on. The picture is becoming clearer. The latest information from the interior about the weapons caches. Okay, now there's an active military buildup close to our borders. Uh, the entire situation was analyzed by our general staff, and our prediction is a future territorial incursion by Rumberg. I have complete trust in the general staff. We will not let you down, Mr. President. The general staff is composed of the smartest military individuals. Okay, I don't know if I trust that exactly. Uh, I require an increase in the military budget to enlist more soldiers. Only then we can stand... Okay, whatever. Falcon is right. We do need to an increase in the military budget, although we don't see eye to eye on exactly how to spend the budget. That much we agree on. Okay, and Lucian's concerned about Rumberg. Okay, everyone's upset. Uh, don't forget that during the election you promised to focus on the military. I expect that word to be kept for the defense of our nation. I am a man of my word, Yosef. Of course you are, and that is why I follow you, Mr. President. The only way we can guarantee the national survival is through a more capable military force against Rumberg. Our country hasn't fallen to any invading force for 200 years. You cannot let it happen, Mr. President. We should find regional allies like Svalga's land or Lesbia to deter Rumberg. There are, are several options on the table. Uh, these options should be considered. They could be considered, but why pander to others? When we can solve these issues ourselves, we have no true friends outside these borders. Okay. Everyone fell silent when a soldier entered the room and let Yosef Lancia know that a call had come through from the Ministry. 
Excuse me, Mr. President. He left the room. Uh, Mr. President, there has been uh, Rumbergian military activity close to the Narble border. I just spoke with the local commander. Falcon, we should go to the ministry and get further updates from our branches. Understood, raising military readiness is the first call of action. If there is truly an extraordinary attempt, you will relay it to you immediately and wait for further orders, Mr. President. Okay. Make sure they know we are observant and ready. Uh, couldn't find a username again, says, It might be paranoid to say, but I think Rumberg is in league with the ATO, which is a clear and present threat to the United Swordland so so Socialist, uh, Socialist Republic. I agree. Rumberg, if not directly in league with the ATO, is clearly a pawn of the capitalist West and must be destroyed. Hail, Swordland. Hail. We're all hailing it now, okay. Uh... Rumberg was already testing us, and the reports from the interior indicate interference inside our borders. Communists, nationalists, blutish rebels, Rumberg, expansionism. What was next? Swordland had always been a key piece in the chessboard of the global rivalry between Arcasia and United Contana. But in recent years, there was no such aggression from Rumberg. Not at these levels, at least. All it takes is one tiny spark to start the flames of war. The phone rang. Rumberg had decided to close their consulate in Lackavan. Well, fuck them. Uh, United Contana Embassy helped protesters. That's kind of fucked up. All right, what do we got? Rumors of infrastructure project. That's correct. Gang violence claims a young girl's life. That's bullshit. 1927, never again. Underhaul construction once again, number one. Okay. Rumberg closes consulate. And Arcasia developed the first ICBM. I guess that's good. But, uh, dinner with the family. After a long day at the palace, I was finally home. I thanked Sergei and walked through the front gates, nodding at the two guards as I went by. Even as I turned the doorknob, I could hear Deanna rushing down the stairs to greet me. I opened the door and there she was, standing in front of me with expectant eyes. Papa, you're home. I'll lift and hug her, I guess. She was growing fast. Lifting her up was no longer as easy as it once was. Oof, that's enough of that. You're a big girl now. She started laughing. Yay, I'm a big girl now. Oh, I hate my daughter. I put her down, and her expression turned serious. Papa, are the bad men gone? It was only one bad man, Deanna, and yes, he's gone now. Okay, Papa. Deanna dashed down the hallway. Papa, or Mama, Papa's here. Okay. There's Monica wearing an apron, holding a spatula. Deanna, what did I tell you? No running in the house. Yes, Mama. Monica approached me and kissed me on the cheek. A tantalizing smell wafted from the kitchen behind her. Darling, you shouldn't have. What do we have a cook for? I felt like going grocery shopping, just like old times. And besides, she can't make your favorites like I can. You mean? Yes! Zabla! That's one of my favorite lines in this game. I love Zabla. It's a chickpea stew topped with beef, braised, and tomatoes and Bergian spices. Traditionally served in a clay pot. It was my uh, absolutely my favorite dish, especially paired with keb -ish. A potent, unfiltered wine from my region. It's my lucky day. What's the occasion? No occasion. I just wanted to cheer everyone up a bit. Her smile faded, and she lowered her voice so that Deanna wouldn't hear. Especially after what happened at the ball. I am worried, Anton, for you, for the children, and for the country. Deanna suddenly appeared next to us. Mama! Yes, sweetheart, I'm hungry. Okay, fucking just settle down. Anton, can you tell Frank to come for dinner? He's been sulking in his room all day. Monica started talking or taking out the china while I headed upstairs to fetch my son. Loud rock and roll music echoed down the hallway from his room. I caught a faint hint of cigarette smoke. Oh my god. Uh, Master Thief Esquire sends 100 bits saying, I'm coming over for dinner, Mr. President. That sounds amazing. Uh, eh, I don't like the chickpeas part. I like the beef part. 
I'm gonna knock on the door. No response. I'm gonna knock on the door again. No response. I'm gonna bang on the door. He turned off his stereo. All right, all right. He unlocked and opened the door. What do you want? Uh, turn those records up louder next time, won't you? I don't think the neighbors heard. Ha ha. Uh, Frank headed downstairs to the dining room, and I followed after. See, Frank needs a bit of a loose, loose touch. He can't, if I tried to curtail him, he'd rebel against me, and that's no good. The table was prepared, and Monica was ladling food onto the plates. Come on, have a seat. It won't be tasty if it's cold. As we started eating, the room went quiet. Monica's cooking was as delicious as ever, but I had the feeling that wasn't the reason nobody spoke. Monica was the first to break the silence. Uh, say, did you know that they refurbished the grocery store? I don't know if you remember the owner. He's been there every day for the past 30 years. Can you imagine doing the same job for so long? What if you were president for 20 years, for example? Uh... Honestly, would that really... Now, I'm gonna say 20 years of this, I'd be dead. Oh, fuck. I realized my poor choice of words too late. Monica looked out at her plate. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> fuck. Okay, Monica. Anyway, the grocer really is a nice person. He threw in some extra vegetables with my... Frank suddenly slammed his hands on the table, rattling the china. Monica, Deanna, and I stared at him. So this is how it's gonna be? We're just gonna sit here like nothing happened? Dad, you could have been killed! Mom could have been killed! Any one of us could have died! Uh, Deanna's lower lips started trembling. Monica put her hand on Frank's shoulder. And what would you have us do? I don't know. Talk about it, maybe. Frank got up from his seat. Fine, let's talk about it. Sit down. I'm gonna be a good dad. Frank took a seat again, scowling. Uh, do you think I would let us go down so easily? <laughs> Frank smirked. No. But it's not up to you, is it? It was just one rogue shooter. We were not even the target. But what if we were? Frank, listen to your father. If your father says we don't need to worry, then we don't need to worry. We have to trust him. Monica turned to me. We all have to trust each other. Things calmed down a bit at the table. We finished our food in silence. Frank got up first and retreated back to his room. Monica lifted Deanna up and plopped her in front of the living room TV before returning to the table. She sat down across from me. Anton, he is still young. Uh, that's what worries me. I made plenty of rash decisions when I was his age. You make plenty of rash decisions now. Frank's not the only one who's scared, Anton. Uh, I promise if there is truly any threat to this family, you'll be the first to know. She got up, stood behind me, and massaged my shoulders for a moment before leaving me alone in the dining room. I sat alone at the table and drained my glass of keb kebbage. Had I been lying to Frank and Deanna, was the threat to my family truly over? Time would tell. Well, shit, I actually think that might be a good time to end it for tonight, because my throat's kind of killing me, so... Reading all this stuff out does take a bit of a toll. So, let's bring back the HUD. Alrighty, so, thank you all so much for joining me for part one in the new Reign of Terror, as Anton Rain is going to turn Swordland into a communist dictatorship. But even though the stream is done tonight, the streaming in general don't stop. Whoops, what'd I just do? Whatever, I'll be back on... What day is it today? It's Friday. Okay, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow for Stellaris Invicta. Uh, you know, the, you know, I mean, same as always these days, playing as the Antares Confederacy. Shit's going down. Actually, no, shit's not going down, and that's the real surprise. For the first time in a while, uh, the nation isn't at risk of falling apart, which means something bad's about to happen. Anyhow, so that's tomorrow. On Monday, we continue our game of Vermintide with the gang over at the Blunderdome and Yeti Boatman, so that's been really cool. Uh, and then on Wednesday, I don't know. I don't know what to play on Wednesday, but I got some ideas, but we'll wait till Wednesday to figure that out. And then one week today, uh, our reign of terror continues, or really gets going. I mean, we haven't really done too much yet, so we gotta get secret police, we gotta fund the military, we gotta do all sorts of things, so that'll be one week today. But, uh, 
Before we go, I think we should raid who's streaming right now. Oh, Sir Squire. Uh, Sir Squire um, raided us a few days ago, and I'd love to return the favor. He's currently playing Fallout 76. Sir Squire seems like a cool guy. He does a lot of political games. I haven't seen as much of his content. But if you like what he's doing, make sure to give him a follow. So, uh, oh, and he's playing Fallout, so let's all yell out, Another settlement needs your help. I'll type it in chat there. You can just copy and paste. Another settlement needs your help. All right. So we'll spam his chat with that. So start the raids or squire. All right. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining me here tonight. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Ugh. As we just get the raid going. All right. See you guys. Have a good weekend. Oh my.